seated. In many ways, it seems like the end of an era for the Oneness Pentecostals. The spiritual giants who led them in the beginning have for the most part passed from the scene, leaving behind them an incredible, gaping, aching void. Dedicated younger men have stepped into leadership roles and in many areas the church has grown and yet the loss of spiritual elders has undoubtedly left a vacuum and the unofficial consensus is that the movement will never really be the same. Their fellowship now nearly 70 years old has survived and even thrived despite occasional factions with dubious motives and a few fickle men with destructive agendas. If you look closely, you can see scratches from numerous skirmishes over policy and scars from bruising battles over doctrinal and lifestyle issues that have arisen through the years. Their friends would say it's a miracle that they are as united as they are after all this time. Their critics would say that once the last of that first generation of elders are gone, the movement will fracture irreparably and fade irreversibly into the pages of religious history. Without doubt, this band of brethren has certainly felt the sting of betrayal over the years. In the early days, they were literally forced out of the institutions they helped to build all because they would not recant the revelation they had received. They left not in anger, but in tears. They had expected all their colleagues to excitedly embrace the glorious truth they had discovered, but instead they were expelled and excommunicated. And they even lived to see some of those same colleagues become mortal enemies of the truth they loved. The betrayals of recent years have been even more difficult to negotiate. As the movement has been repeatedly battered by the twin evils of liberalism and legalism, men who paid no price to form the fellowship have presumed to fracture the fellowship. A few leaders enamored with position and preeminence have at times polarized the very people they claim to be serving. Others with big plans but small conviction have departed to follow dreams of grandeur but have landed in a nightmare of doctrinal delusion, abandoning the power of revelation for the poverty of religious philosophies. One has to wonder if they ever really were listening to the earnest exhortation of esteemed elders who paid such a price to pass them the torch of truth. Some of those who have departed now look down with disdain on those same elders, believing that the message they preached in those bygone days is sorely in need of renovation and rehabilitation. And rather than feeling the loss of divine revelation, they actually believe they have improved on the feeble efforts of the elders. Their apostasy is sad, but their arrogance is shocking. At the same time, secular society has apparently left the oneness Pentecostals behind, smugly declaring their old-fashioned convictions irrelevant to the mainstream, chastising them for their inflexible insistence on details of doctrine and matters of modesty. And they have summarily pronounced the apostolic church a forgotten relic of a bygone era. Corrupt politicians have moved beyond passing laws that restrict the church to an outright agenda of censure and persecution. So-called alternative lifestyles are becoming the norm. Children are being educated to defy their parents and question authority. Immorality is rampant and even celebrated by every pundit and performer who stands to entertain the masses. The worst kinds of sin are no longer seen as scandalous. Abortion, adultery, divorce, and debauchery are defended as healthy choices of a mature society. 
Addiction, perversion, war, murder, and violence have become commonplace. The very fabric of culture itself has morphed into something sinister. Good is called evil, and evil is called good. And unfortunately, the wider world of religion, in a misguided attempt to remain acceptable and attractive, has declared heresy to be orthodoxy and orthodoxy to be heresy. The oneness Pentecostals are being criticized and ostracized from every direction. However, despite these formidable and seemingly insurmountable obstacles, somehow the apostolic church has continued to defy all reasonable odds and grow dramatically. Despite the flood of false doctrines and lax lifestyles, thousands are still embracing the experience preached at the beginning, selling out to a transformative revelation of truth. Churches are still being planted. Missionaries are still being sent. And believers are still being born again of water and of the Spirit, just as Jesus said. And yet, if you listen very closely, at the end of a glorious century filled with revelation, as it draws to a close, you can hear a still small voice of caution, rightly raised in reference to the future. Will the church begin to slide or continue to stand? Will what the older generation died for remain what the younger generation lives for? It is at that precise moment at the end of a century very much like ours when culture is confused when people are perplexed when truth is being trampled and when divine destiny will undoubtedly be decided that the last remaining elder of the previous generation picks up his pen one final time to anchor the current generation to the foundational truth that has bound this fellowship of the redeemed together for nearly 70 years. And he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Don't miss it. He means to echo the first verse in your Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But he doesn't stop there. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This powerful revelation of Jesus' identity, it's not merely an academic theological construct to John. It is burned in his brain. It is seared in his spirit. His memory is so keen, 60 plus years later, that he still remembers the very hour he first met Jesus at 4 o'clock one afternoon. He still recalls little details that there were six water pots at the wedding in Cana that the Samaritan woman forgot her water pot in her haste to go share her testimony. He still remembers that an anonymous cripple at the pool of Bethesda had been sick for 38 years. And he still remembers that the high priest's servant was named Malchus. It's burned in his memory. And John must have handled the financial details of the fishing business for his father. Because 60 years later, there was enough accountant in him to still remember what the feeding of the 5,000 would have cost if they'd had to pay for it out of the general fund. 200 penny worth, worth of bread. See, John was an eyewitness of this. 1 John 1 he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, 
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and we bear witness and we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. John was one of the first original oneness Pentecostals of the first century. And at the end of that glorious century, he wants to make sure to anchor the next generation to ground zero foundational fundamental truth of the apostolic age. He writes in 1 John, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one the operative and the emphasized verse in, in the word in this verse is not the word three. It is the word one. John is not alluding to a trinity because at this point in history, there's no such thought in the church. The trinity only exists in many pagan religions in the Far East. India has her Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Israel's ancient slave master, Egypt. They have a trinity, Osiris, Horus, and Isis. Israel's arch enemy, Babylon. They have a trinity, Nimrod, Tammuz, and Semiramis. The brilliant Greeks, they have their trinity, Zeus, Apollo, and Athena. The brutal Romans, they have their capitoline triad, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. And and every time Israel has backslidden, they've served a Canaanite trinity, Baal, Molech, and Ashtoreth. But that's not what John was writing about. John doesn't have that in mind. That's paganism. When he writes, these three are one, he echoes these words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. As John puts his pen to paper more than 60 years after Pentecost, he's keenly aware that he is the only original voice left. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are gone. They wrote their Gospels to the Jews, the Romans, and the Greeks 30 years previous. His friend Peter is gone, crucified head downward at his own request because he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as his master. The prolific pen of the Apostle Paul has been forever silenced since his brutal beheading at the hands of the same emperor, the despotic Nero. But all of these these martyrdoms are now 30 years in the past, and John has now served as the sole surviving elder of the first century for several years. And that's why his gospel does more than any other gospel to tell us not just what Jesus did or what Jesus said, but who Jesus is. Please hear me, because if we lose that revelation, no other revelation matters. If we lose who Jesus is, nothing else works in the apostolic church. The new birth doesn't work without the name of Jesus. Divine healing doesn't operate without the name of Jesus. Worship accomplishes absolutely zero without the name that is above every other name. But when you put the name of Jesus and the revelation of who he is, and then you lift up your hands, and then you lift up your voice, and then you pray in faith, and then you preach, it's all over for hell, and it's just started for hell. I wish you lift up your voice and give God high praise tonight. Jesus! 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 
Jesus. Ela era o From his opening sentence, John's on a mission to prove that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was. He is the true and the only God in a body of flesh. And if you read the Gospels, you Bible lovers, you know this. 90% of John's Gospel is unique. There are no parables in John. But there are many conversations with Nicodemus, with the Samaritan woman, with Mary and Martha, with Peter and with many others. John is very selective about the miracles he records. Some are unique only to him, like the raising of Lazarus. And the ones he does record, he twins them with Jesus' teaching. Jesus multiplies loaves and then teaches I am the bread of life. He opens blind eyes and then he says, I am the light of the world. John is on a mission to tell that first century church about their Jesus that they have been preaching for nearly 70 years. Could I dare to tell you that this conference, this general assembly of our fellowship, we're on a mission this year to tell you that Jesus that we've been preaching for nearly 70 years in the United Pentecostal Church, that message hasn't changed. We're not about ready to water it down or quiet it down. We're still here to say that it's all in him. You're never out of order in the middle of a sermon to raise your voice and lift up the name of Jesus. Only in John's gospel does Jesus talk at such length to everybody about his identity. John is the only gospel writer who intentionally records what the theologians call the I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's invisible. In our English version of the scriptures, we only see a pronoun I and a verb, am, I am. But it's more than obvious in the ancient language. It was so obvious to the hearers when Jesus said in the Greek, Ego I me, a carpenter from Nazareth that they didn't even like. He was using the ancient name of God that was revealed to Moses at the burning bush. He was reaching back into the greatest moment of revelation in Hebrew history and saying, I am that I am, the one who appeared to Moses, that's me. One of our brilliant oneness scholars, Brother David S. Norris, said, when Moses asked, who shall I say sent me, God responded, Eye, asher, eye, a proclamation uttered in Hebrew. It's in the Hebrew imperfect. And in this case, because it's in that tense, it represents the potential of what will occur. I am that I am might almost be better understood as I will be who I will be. God is about to do what his name means. God's telling Moses, yeah, there will be a contest between Jehovah and all the multiplicity of gods of ancient 
Egypt. But when we get all done and the dust settles, all of those deities will be proven to be false and God himself will be exalted. When God says, I am, he makes a challenge to every false god in this world. Any god that would ever make a claim against you, any enemy that would ever encroach on your life, your home, your marriage, your kids, when God says, I am, that means they're not. Don't you let them just trample all over your kids and your marriage and your home. You have a right to go to prayer because they're not, but I am. Doesn't it make sense that his name should be I am? And doesn't it also make sense that everybody else's name should be they're not? Stop looking for meaning in your little one and only solitary life. Stop looking for it in popularity and in money and in power and in your friends and in your activity and in your social life. Stop doing that. They're not, but I am. And I know, I know, I know. Theologians and denominations, entire groups of Christians today have missed this. But if you read the Gospel of John at the end of the first century, it's very obvious that the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, knew exactly what Jesus was saying. You read John chapter 8 and you'll find this running discourse. Jesus looks at them and says, before Abraham was, I am. Now that's either really bad grammar or he's not using grammar. Before your father Abraham ever set one foot out of Ur of the Chaldees to follow a God he couldn't see to a land he'd never seen, I was there to give him the direction. Jesus wasn't claiming to be part of God, like God, sort of God, a smaller God. He was claiming to be the I am, that I am, that first talked to Abraham. Jesus looked at them and he said, if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. And then he said, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am. Everywhere you read in John, this last gospel of the first century, everywhere you read, Jesus is using his name. He speaks his name at a well, and a nameless woman's life is forever changed. He speaks his name during a storm, and an ordinary man named Peter is empowered to step out on the waves of the sea and defy every law of gravity and physics and walk on the water. Jesus speaks his name in a garden at midnight and an entire battalion of Roman soldiers, highly trained professionals, they fall on the ground like a bunch of cordwood and you think the devil can throw anything against you that the name of Jesus can't handle. That's just not even computing with me. This name is higher than every sickness, every enemy, every opposition, every attack. This is the one and only name of the one and only God. You don't understand what power you're unleashing when you use the name of Jesus. You don't understand. It's like a little three-year-old playing with dynamite when you call on his name. The devil backs off, backs up, shuts down, shuts up because he can't compete with the name. I wish you lift up that apostolic voice of yours. And I wish you'd call on the name of the Lord. Yes, 
Sobaa. What you don't understand is when you did that, you lose healing in this room. What you don't understand is as you're doing this, there's deliverance walking through this room. Just take your praiser and spin the volume dial one more time and lift Jesus up. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. You can be seated. When God said, I am, that Hebrew name comes from four consonants. Yod, He, Vav, He. It's Hebrew, of course, reads the opposite direction from English, from right to left. That's called the tetragrammaton. Ancient Hebrew was written only in consonants, and so those who read it aloud, they supplied the vowel sounds. And to roughly translate that name into English, there's really no completely accurate translation. We just have to say the eternal. And instead of Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, sometimes later the development in, in our language was J-H-V-H, and we say Jehovah. It's all the same name. Represents the same God. Now the Jews, after... The captivity in Babylon around 450 B.C. when they came back. They realized that God had been unhappy with them and allowed their nation to go into captivity. And so they became almost paranoid about blaspheming the name of God. They, they took extreme positions on scriptures about blasphemy. And they began to do something really, really strange. They began to outlaw the use of the name of their own God. First, they outlawed saying the name among the common people. Later, they expanded that and said, well, even the priests, we better be careful. They shouldn't say this holy name, Yahweh. And then, finally, they passed a law about 300 years before Jesus. They passed a law that said even the high priest was not allowed to speak the name of God aloud. When Simon, who was the last high priest that we know, who used the name of God, when he died in 270 B.C., they passed a total prohibition against speaking the name of God aloud. They used a substitute word, Adonai, which meant Lord. And so when they were reading in the sacred scripture and they would come to that holy name, they wouldn't dare say it. They'd say Adonai, Lord, the substitute word. And the congregation would respond, Hashem, the name. They knew it was there, but they wouldn't speak it. What a ridiculous proposition that the people to whom God had given such a powerful revelation were ashamed and embarrassed and afraid to speak his name aloud. But that is exactly what's so striking about John's gospel. Because all of a sudden, out of the blue, a carpenter from Nazareth begins walking the streets using the name that no Israelite, no priest, and not even the high priest has spoken for nearly nearly 300 years, and all of a sudden this Jesus is using that holy name as though it's his own name. You know why he did that? Because it was his own name. He had a right to speak that name.
When Jesus said, I am, he wasn't using a pronoun and a verb. He was using the ancient, holy name of God first revealed to Moses at the burning bush. And when Jesus used that name, he used it just the same as I'd use the name Raymond. It was his name to use. It was his authority to operate in. They didn't like it, but we love it because we know who Jesus is. Let me take a two-minute detour and we'll come back. Much of the Old Testament is written in what the scholars would call a coded form. I'm not talking about the new books, the Bible code and all that. You believe about that, what you want. But the Bible has beautiful patterns in it. If you open your King James Bible to Psalm 119 and you look at the 22 sections, each one of them are labeled over the top with a Hebrew letter because all of the eight verses in each of those 22 sections begins with the Hebrew letter over the top of that section. The book of Lamentations, a similar pattern, 22 verses in each of the chapters, uh, and, and it's the Hebrew letters in order at the beginning of each verse. Third chapter of Lamentations, it's three verses at a time, 66 verses. The Jews learned this. Uh, I, I read a story not too long ago about a little preschool Hebrew boy that had memorized huge sections of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. The Jews knew so much about the divine arrangement of Scripture. It's startling that these people that read and studied the Word, they missed the Word when He came in flesh. So just keep that in mind and let's go back to what John's talking about. There was this obscure little verse in Leviticus chapter 21 verse 10 in the law. And it said that he that is the high priest among his brethren upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments. He shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. And then we come to the weekend that Jesus is on trial. And Jesus has irritated the Sanhedrin over and over again. The Pharisees hate him. The Sadducees despise him. He's been hauled in now before the high court of Israel. And they can't get him to say anything. Until Mark records this in 1461. Jesus held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus, standing face to face, face with the high priest of Israel who has never spoken the name of God. His father never spoke the name of the God they pray to. His grandfather never spoke the name of the God that Israel is all about. His great grandfather never pronounced this name aloud. And Jesus looks at the high priest of Israel and says, I am and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. They might not know, know who Jesus was, but he knew who he was, and we know who he is. But that's not where it stops. you got to imagine this. Caiaphas is so angered at that moment. He is so angry at this Nazarene who dares to use the holy name of God. The Bible says, and the high priest rent his clothes and said, what need we any further witnesses? You've heard his blasphemy. They all condemned Jesus to be guilty of death at that precise moment when the holy high priest of Israel lifted up his hands and ripped his garment. He disobeyed the law in Leviticus 21 verse 10. And at that precise instance, the high priesthood of Israel passed from Caiaphas to the prisoner of Caiaphas. Jesus didn't just go to the cross as a victim. He went to the cross as the the high priest bearing a sacrifice for our sins. That wasn't just a murder. That was salvation.
That's why the writer of Hebrews, many, many years later, he says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Apostolics, hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Apostolics, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. If you are filled with the Holy Ghost and you've got anything in your belly that would like to get out and worship, now would be a really good time to lift up your voice and speak in tongues. Jesus is in this room right this minute. <laughs> God is attending general conference. Jesus is in this room with us. Right now. Jesus has enraged the Sanhedrin many times by using this name. But this time he's done it in a court of law. And so they rush him to Pilate and they demand that he be crucified. And even though, you know the story, Pilate is impressed with Jesus, they force him to carry out the crucifixion through political pressure. And Pilate is powerless to save the Nazarene even if he wanted to. And then we come to the Gospel of John, written at the end of the first century of truth. And he writes these words in 19 and 19. Pilate wrote a title, and he put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified. It was near the city, and it was written in three languages, Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, wait a minute, don't write the king of the Jews. Change it, Pilate. Right? He said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate, I don't know what he knew about Jesus, suspected about Jesus, or believed about Jesus, but he answered, what I have written, I have written. Literally, what I have written, I will not change one bit. Pilate writes this inscription and has it placed on the cross of Jesus in three languages, Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now, it's just another epitaph to the Greeks and the Romans. They don't really care. But the Bible tells us specifically, as many of the Jews begin to gather and look at the inscription over the Galilean, the chief priests suddenly see that they have a problem. They rush to Pilate and they say, don't write it that way. Change it. Say, he said, I'm king of the Jews. And Pilate said, I won't change it. Now, what is the problem that doesn't upset the Romans and doesn't upset the Greeks, but just causes such anxiety and consternation to the Jews. Written over Jesus' head in Hebrew was Yeshua Hanazari Vimelech Hayehudim, Hebrew from right to left. But to the Jewish leaders who were used to studying Scripture, and they were used to studying the beauty of Psalm 119 and the book of Lamentations and looking at the first letter of verses and paragraphs and the first letter of words. When they looked at those words, they saw something different. This is what they saw. Over the head of Jesus, Yeshua HaNazarite Vimelech HaYehudim was Y-H-W-H. It was Yahweh spelled out over the head of Jesus as he hung on the cross. Why? Because it wasn't a carpenter that died that day. It wasn't the dead founder of our religion that died that day. It was God himself 
robed in flesh, shedding his blood. That's why Paul said, take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Apostolics watch, feed the church of God because the church, he has purchased it with his own blood. That's why you can be healed tonight because it wasn't a carpenter's blood. It's the blood of the living, never dying God. Even after their enemy is dead, the chief priests are still nervous. Matthew tells us in his account that they come to Pilate and they say, get some Roman guards, secure the tomb. I don't know what Pilate knows. I don't know what he understands, believes, or thinks about Jesus. But I do know what he says. He says, go your way. Make the tomb as sure as you can. I hope he was thinking, if that man said he's going to rise from the dead, chances are he's going to rise from the dead. And so we come to what we now call Easter Sunday morning. You have to understand Easter from the perspective of the disciples. John's looking back 60 years, but when it happened, it was a heartbreak. Their entire lives crumbled at the cross. They thought Jesus was gone. And then this little lady named Mary comes to the tomb in John 20. And the Bible tells us as she stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the sepulcher. Been there several times. A flat stone bed where the body of Jesus laid. And she seeth two angels in white sitting. The one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the feet. One at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. When Mary looked into the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, she saw the most familiar silhouette in all of his he- Hebrew history. Here's what she saw. A silhouette of a sacred article. A silhouette that represented the Shekinah presence of Almighty God. You know why? Because on that weekend, the Shekinah of Almighty God had been in that tomb and that's why there was no body there on Easter Sunday morning. Oh, I wish you'd lift up the name of Jesus that is above every other name. Yes, 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 yes. But the Ella had your door, says Shabba. Yes, yes. Every Bible scholar and linguist worth their salt will tell you that John's gospel actually ends with chapter 20, and chapter 21 is a postscript. And chapter 20 ends this way. John records the story of the first church service after Jesus' resurrection. The disciples are all there, and Jesus appears to them. That must have been a moment. Be very, very careful, because there's one disciple who for 2,000 years has retained the name Doubting Thomas, And all he did wrong was he missed the early service. Just saying. And then there's another service. Thomas has talked to the disciples and said, I'm sorry guys, I saw him die. I know what you're saying, but I have to believe you're delusional because I saw the crucifixion. And I saw the nails and I saw the crown of thorns and I saw the spear. And I just can't believe, in fact, he'd have to appear to me 
and he'd have to show me the nail prints in his hand. He'd have to show me that spear so I'd know it was him. He'd have to tell me that he's alive. I can't believe it from you. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Jesus appears in their midst and says, Thomas, Thomas, it's me. And when Thomas realizes the significance of mortal wounds that would kill any human being in the body of a living man who is talking to him, Thomas grabs two words and smashes them together. My curios and my theos. My master and almighty God. My Lord and my God. That's the revelation John's writing about at the end of the first century. He's saying to everyone who will ever follow him, don't ever lose this. This is why we preached. This is why we baptized. This is why we sent missionaries. This is why we planted churches. Because we weren't just preaching a religion. This is Jesus. My Lord... And my God. Oh, but that's not the best part. Jesus says, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. But Thomas, <laughs> blessed are they that have not seen me and have yet believed. Thomas, there's coming another group of oneness Pentecostals that never walked with me on the shores of the Galilee. And they never sat at a campfire in Judea. But they'll get the revelation just like you. If you got that revelation, would you let it out in your praise and worship the name of Jesus? Jesus. 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 You don't understand what power you just unleashed in this room when you began to put that revelation together with that name, together with your voice. If you're waiting for something, something is already here. Someone is already here. A so shop. Hey, 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 Oh, let that praise out. Let it ascend to the rafters. Jesus. 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 So I'm sorry if you need the Holy Ghost right now in this place and you have repented of your sins, you've asked God to forgive you for being an unrighteous sinner, and you would love to receive his spirit 
and this revelation into your life. You don't even have to come to the front. We'll do that in a minute. But if you'd like to receive the Holy Ghost in an instant of time, you can do it right now. Lift up your hands and begin to worship God. If you know a friend that's beside you that needs the Holy Ghost, for heaven's sake, lay your hand on them and begin to pray in the name of Jesus. Yes. 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 Brother Herod, Brother Robinette, come on up here real quick. This is why we send missionaries. This is why we plant churches. This is why we preach the gospel. This is why we do what we do and why we are who we are. It's nothing in us. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. These two young missionaries are two of my friends, and we love what they're doing for God. And they are missionaries in Europe, which for years we just kind of despaired. And now Europe is a hotbed of apostolic revival. Brother Herod, how many people have you seen on deputation healed in the name of Jesus this term? Over 1,500. Over 1,500 people healed. I'm not talking about we think so. I'm talking about this man puts pictures on his website and everywhere else of people that have been healed. That's the power not of Nathan Herod. That's the power of the name of Jesus. And that power, you you don't understand. It's in this room right now. If that can happen in every kind of little rural church across America, and if that can happen in Spain, what in the world could happen with all these apostolics here tonight? Brother Robinette, how many people have you seen receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost on this deputation? Over 4,000. Over 4,000 people in deputation services. Receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But folks, look at this. All of these missionaries, they've all got people that have received the Holy Ghost. They preach the gospel in places you wouldn't even want to book a hotel room. Some of them. They've gone into every kind of nation and city and village and town. And you know why they went? It's not because it's such an easy life being a missionary or there's such a great retirement plan. It's because as soon as we get the name of Jesus in the soil of of any country, of any province, of any state, of any city, of any village. The miraculous is unleashed. Now we're going to need you. I'm done. I've got more notes than I could shake a stick at, but I'm finished. But Jesus hasn't even started here tonight. I know of one lady that's going to be baptized at the end of this service. Sister Vonnie Marshall taught a Bible study 20 minutes to a precious Hindu lady two days ago, and she's going to be baptized in Jesus' name in just a few minutes. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. You say, why do I need to be baptized? Because when the name of Jesus comes in contact with sin, defeat, sickness, death, affliction, addiction, all of that has to flee because Jesus is the one and only name of the one and only God. 